Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome in. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar, Medicaid Promoting Interoperability, Let's Talk Patient Engagement. My name is Brianna Greer, Program Coordinator here at Hybrid Solutions. Who are we, you might ask? We are Georgia's Health IT Center, assisting clinicians across the state of Georgia to promote interoperability through the successful use of EHR technology. Highbridge collaborates with healthcare systems across the state of Georgia, Department of Community Health, Georgia Health Information Network, and many other community and professional partners. We are located at Moore Health School of Medicine, National Center for Primary Care. Our executive director is Carmen Hughes, and our executive medical director is Dr. Dominic Mack. We welcome our guest speaker for this webinar, Ryan Spikes um, of Maripa Consulting, LLC. Ryan is a registered nurse who completed her ONC slash AH IMA certification and began utilizing health information technology to increase healthcare efficacy, efficiency, excuse me, and while and quality while reducing costs and improving patient outcomes. Since 2013, Ryan has been working with hybrid solutions as a practice practice transformation consultant. Ms. Spikes has helped over 400 ambulatory providers achieve meaningful use and is now working with them towards health information exchange. We also have our wonderful program manager here at Hybrid Solutions, Selena Williams, presenting as well. A quick announcement for physicians who are eligible for Medicaid Promoting Interoperability Program, MAPR portal now is open in GAMIS to accept applications for the payment year 2020. Thank you guys so much, and I will now turn it over to Selena. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Today's objectives is as follows. Promote patient electronic access, implement and maintain standard-based patient access API, review patient education requirements, and review coordination of care through patient engagement. So we're in the last couple of years of promoting interoperability, stage three. And of course, the reporting period has changed. So here, uh, here is the reporting period for 2020. So 9090 reporting period for 2020. So all participating and eligible providers will be able to attest to a minimum, any continuous 90 day period within a calendar year for your meaningful use dashboard. So your performance dashboard, you can provide a 90 day reporting period. EPs must also attest to a 90-day patient volume calculator. Current calendar, you can use the current calendar year or prior full calendar year from Jane, anytime from January to December. The good news this year is in the past, we've been attesting for a full calendar year for clinical quality measures, but this year, all providers will have the opportunity to attest to a 90-day clinical quality measure. So if you're already ready to attest, you have all your um, documents ready, the map report is open and you can start your attestation. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have another polling question. Just wanna kind of get a poll of how many providers will be participating for a program year 2020 stage three. Okay, thank you so much, Brianna. So we have the results here that looks like at least 44% are saying that they do plan to attest for program year 2020. So our information will be at the end of this um, presentation and how you can reach out to us, to how you can contact us to assist you. And it looks like 56% says not applicable. So I'm not sure, um, maybe they've reached all three years or just not interested in participating. But however, those 56% that are not interested, reach out to us and maybe we can change your mind and um, assist you and walk you through the process. It is kind of challenging. So that's what we're here for, to assist. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead into the presentation. Um, we know for stage three, there's eight objectives, but our focus today is gonna to be on patient electronic access and coordination of care. Provide patients electronic access to their health information. What do you have to do? So of course you have to provide the access information and instructions necessary to grant access to the patient or their authorized representative in order to view download and transmit their health information. When you provide that information to the, to the patient or the um, authorized representative, you must maintain dated report, screenshot, or other documentation to prove a patient or representative is given that access to view, download, or transmit their health information. Next slide, please. 
What is timely electronic access? So this states that the provider must give more than 80% of their patients or authorized representative timely access to view, download, or transmit his or her health record. My advice is to provide the patient this at lo these login credentials at check-in. The patient must be given access using any application program interface of their choice, API. Try to encourage the patients to engage with the practice via the portal. It is convenient. I know some providers may not have the staff or capability, however, using an intern to sign patients, in, sign patients up and assist them with logging onto the portal to view, download, and transmit their medical record while in the office. So that's 80% on measure one. Measure two states that the EP must provide the information from the EHR to identify the patient's specific education resources and provide electronic access to those materials more than 35%. Once again, it must be done electronically. Handing the patient this at checkout while they're in the room would not suffice. The provider must satisfy both measures for this objective through combination of meeting the threshold. And so here's um, just some ways that you can try to um, encourage your patients to to get on the um, to get on their patient portal and get access to their records. So have every employee in the office encourage patients to use, especially the doctor can give the script on what they need to do. The front, front office staff, when they come in, they can give that information. Sometimes give some kind of, um, some practices say, okay, if you sign up to the patient portal, log on to your information, we may give you a $5 gift card to Starbucks. So that may be ways to encourage patients to get on the patient portal. The nursing staff or front office to encourage patients to log in while waiting. Sometimes when in the waiting room, a lot of offices have computers in their waiting room and they, the patients, they allow the patients to sign up while they're in the room. Encourage the guardians to use this as well. Provide patients electronic access. The provider ensures the patient's health information is available to access using any application of their choice. We've already discussed this and this must be done within 48 hours of the patient coming into the office. So when the patient comes into the office, you must give them the access to log on to the patient portal. It must be done 40 um, hours within the patient being seen. The doctor must have closed the medical record and done all documentation for the patient to be able to access their record. So that's very important that this is done within 48 hours of the patient being seen. The number of patients in the denominator or patient authorized representative who are provided time or access to health information to view online and download transmit to the third party and access using an application of their own. So um, these are kind of some of the instructions. If you could go to the next slide, Brianna. So this kind of also states to implement an API and EP must need fully enable the API functionality. It must be enabled in the system. A screenshot must be taken and this information should also be provided when you upload um, your application to Mapper. So it's, it's enabled in the system. You take a screenshot and provide this information to prove that this application was enabled for the patient to be able to um, access this functionality. So provide patient electronic access. So here's just an example of one of the patients that um, this is an e-clinical patient. So if a provider is not sure how to do this, that's what we're here for. We can be a liaison to get on the phone with your EHR vendor to contact your vendor to ensure that this API is able and set up correctly in your system. This is very important. Obtain a user guide, a quick reference for your patients so they will know how to access this API. Obtain a list of available applications. They must be given this, this link and this application listing the APIs of their choice that's um, compatible to the EHR that the provider is using. Obtain the patient instructions and the link. All this must be done. And we have an example. We've had some providers that has um, given us instructions and what they're, use, what they're using and providing to their patients. So if you haven't had this done, you can reach out to us and we can kind of help you and assist with um, what needs to be done or what needs to be given, what information that needs to be on that handout that you're providing to the patients. So um, test the instructions, use the instructions, um, let one of the staffs train your staff, experiment internally to ensure that it is working appropriately. Distribute to all patients. 
and you can include the opt-out instructions as well. So if the patient is opting out and they don't want to access the portal, access this API, make sure you are including those instruct instructions to the patients. And so here's an example of, um, and I know you guys may not be able to see this. So this is um, what one provider is using, the instructions, and it lists um, all the information that needs to be on there. It has the instructions, it has the link of the API. So if they click on this link, it will take them to um, this. And for example, this is an Allscript application um, that Allscript, one of Allscript vendors is using that they're giving to their patients. So when you click on this link, it will take them to the available APIs that are compatible to the Allscripts application. Okay, so I will turn this over to Ryan and she's gonna um, share a video, kind of give you an example and an analogy of how the API works. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about an API. They're a lot more familiar, a lot more useful used a lot more often than you see them, but you don't usually see the API part of it. This analogy is, makes the API a waiter, a waiter in a restaurant. Or for a lot of us, since we've been home with COVID, we've used certain applications like Uber Eats. Well, there's an API in that application that talks to the restaurant and tells them what, they, what we want and sends that, and then find somebody to get that and bring it back to us. All of that is the use of an API, um, but in the use of healthcare, an API would be, or the customer would be the patient, and that customer may, that patient may be using a app to track their diabetes and their daily um, blood sugars. So that app will use an API to send that information to the doctor's EHR. The doctor will get a notification if the blood sugar is out of normal range. The doctor may send back a change in the insulin or a change in the treatment plan for the patient. That will also go back through the API and go back to that app or menu so that the customer or patient can see it. So the API is pretty much the go-between. If you can go to the next slide, we're gonna watch a video on how it specifically applies to stage three meaningful use. Meaningful use stage three aims to increase patient engagement and improve patient outcomes. How? By requiring hospitals and health professionals to use certified electronic health record or EHR systems. One focus area for this technology is to provide healthcare consumers flexibility in how they access their personal health information safely and securely. With Stage 3, patients will have the opportunity to connect to their EHRs using an application of their choosing that is supported by an application programming interface, or API. Just think of an API as the wiring to an outlet in a house. If the house is properly wired, electricity will flow and power on an appliance when one is plugged in. Similarly, hospitals and providers are wiring their electronic health records with APIs. So they will be ready to enable the flow of personal health information when consumers use a new app. Let's take a look at a patient's journey after health systems have implemented API technology. Meet Kate, a 57-year-old spouse and parent living with type 2 diabetes and neuropathy. She was recently hospitalized due to complications with her diabetes and prescribed new medications. Upon discharge, Kate follows up with her neurologist, whose office is in a separate health system. He makes some additional adjustments to her current medications. As her medication requirements have grown more complex, Kate wants an easier way to keep track of all of them. After hearing about an app that helps organize and remind her to take her medications, she decides to download it to her mobile phone to help better manage her care. Kate creates an account and authorizes the app to connect to the different EHR systems at the hospital and her physician's office. Luckily for Kate, both venues now have the proper technological framework to support the use of patient-centered apps, thanks to Meaningful Use Stage 3. 
Both systems have already worked with their IT vendor to configure their health systems to allow seamless data transmission to the mobile app. Kate now has access to her medical record from both venues and can use the app to pull in all of her medication information so that she can keep track of them in one convenient location moving forward. Kate is now engaged more than ever in her own health thanks to open platforms that provide her with options to access her personal health information from different electronic health records. At Cerner, we offer solutions and services to help you navigate the ever-changing health industry. We're like your regulatory easy button to help you focus on what's most important, keeping the patient at the center of care. Contact us to find out how we can help create healthier stories tomorrow, today. We aren't promoting or denying Cerner. As you know, we are vendor neutral, but I think that is an amazing uh, video on how to explain what an API is as it relates to Meaningful Use Stage 3. Uh, for, so another part of that same measure object for measure five, objective two is patient education. You must provide patient education through the portal that is relevant to the patient's care. It must come from your EHR and go through the portal. It used to be that you would provide a paper base and check a box, but that is no longer applicable. It must go electronically and visit summaries do not count as patient education. It must be something applicable to the diagnosis or medications. So the next objective is number six, and that is care coordination through patient engagement. This is where your patients come in. This is where we've got to get them engaged and utilizing their EHR. The first, there are three measures in this objective. Um, you must meet, they all have a 5% threshold. You must meet the 5% for at least two of the three measures to pass this objective. Um, we are trying to help you meet the 5% or greater for all of the measures because eventually you will have to do that. Uh, so the first measure, the first of the two is view down, first of the three, I'm sorry, is view download and transmit. And that is when a patient can pull up their patient portal or their API and access their information on your EHR software. So it could be whether they're in another provider's office and they're pulling up their medication list, they can pull up lab results, they can send it from your portal to another provider, or they can download it for their own personal use. But as long as they open it and actually open one of the applications, not just open and log into their portal, they actually have to look at something in there, then that will count for towards your meaningful use. So you have to encourage your patients to use that. They encourage them if they're calling the office saying, listen, I need my x-ray readout from last week or I need my labs reports, encourage them at that point to get on the portal and try and pull it up there. Uh, the second one, and like I said, they can do this either through the, directly through the portal or through an API. So measure two is that the provider send a secure electronic message from their EHR to the patient. It counts, the EHR only counts them for meaningful use when they come from the provider. So if your patient sends you a secure message, making a request or just saying, hey, thanks for seeing me, send a reply and that reply counts. Now, what is important for these two measures is that, and I'll go into this more detail, it can happen anytime throughout the calendar year. Measure three is patient-generated health data from a non-clinical setting incorporated into the CERT. This can be the patient filling out forms and you're incorporating them from the portal into your software. Um, for pediatricians, a lot of times what they use is the developmental surveys you make those electronic, the patient fills them out, and then you pull them into your software. This usually requires an extra step on behalf of the office in order to pull that information into the software. It doesn't automatically go. And for some softwares, it may come over as if the forms are complete and then the front office will print them out or tell the doctor the forms are complete. That doesn't actually count. You have to pull them into the software. 
Uh, so you, uh, my suggestion would be to contact your EHR vendor and find out exactly how to pull information from the patient portal into the software so it hits structured data fields. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, as I mentioned, for view, download, and transmit and secure messaging, the actions can happen anytime during the calendar year. As long, but they only count for patients that were seen during your 90 day period. So the denominator has a set of patients and usually in your EHR, you can pull that list of which patients are counted in your denominator. And in your numerator, you have all patients who have either viewed, downloaded, and transmit up to from, the, from January 1st up to the date that you're pulling the list or, um, or you sent a secure message to them. Um, and one of the main reasons for this being outside of this, the reporting period is that providers sometimes see patients on the last day of the reporting period and send the patient labs two days later and they view those. Well, that patient is automatically going to be in your denominator, so you don't want them to count against you in your numerator because the labs didn't come in for two days after the reporting period. So I'll put an example. If your reporting period is January to March, you see one patient on March 5th and you see another patient on March 30th. And it, here it is now September 15th and you're pulling your dashboard now. Well, let's say your first patient actually pull, transmitted the records from, your, from her portal to a specialist on September 1st. And your second patient, you sent a secure message to that patient from your EHR on June 1st. Both of those should be counted in your numerator so that you can meet this measure. My suggestion in this is to make sure when you pull your dashboard, if you're not meeting the measure, pull the reports for which patients are showing up in your numerators and denominators. And you, it may take some legwork and that is something that Highbridge can help you with. It may take some legwork to make sure that you're being that you're counting patients throughout the year, the calendar year, and not just during the reporting period. So the required documentation, as you know, when you attest to meaningful use in the state of Georgia through the Mapper software, you have to upload a number of documents. First, you need to upload your detailed encounter volume report. This is for your 30% Medicaid patient volume. This is the report you use to get the information for your patient volume calculator. That detailed encounter volume report has to include the date of service, a provider, na a provider name, a patient identifier, whether it be their name or their ID number, um, and their type of insurance on that date of service. Remember, you can pull primary and secondary Medicaid encounters. Um, you can pull encounters that were paid or denied, but the rule is you can only encounter one encounter per patient per day. Some patients may have a doctor's visit and then later that day have a nurse visit. You can only count one of those encounters. Usually you'll see that on your um, report if you pull it from your software in Excel, which the preferred format is in Excel. You can upload this in Excel or PDF. But if you upload it in a PDF, you need to include a summary of how many patients were under each insurance type. But if you upload it in Excel, you can usually sort it to make sure that you're counting one encounter per patient per day. You also have your patient volume calculator. Make sure you pull the current 2020 patient volume calculator and your Highbridge consultant can send that to you or you can pull it from the DCH website. You can use a 90-day period for this patient volume calculator. It can either be from 2019 or 2020 up until the date of attestation. But you cannot cross the calendar year when you're pulling this, this encounter volume. You need to upload your security risk assessment, which has to be um, done every five years and renewed and reviewed every year or every time you change software or major, make a major change within your practice. Um, you have to have your screenshots for your yes, no measures, your clinical decision support, your drug, drug, drug allergy interactions, and any documentation for exclusion, yes, no measure and documentation for exclusion also covers your um, 
public health measure. Again, if you have more questions about public health, there's a lot, there's as much information there as we went in today about patient portals. So your high bridge consultant can help you with that too. And you have to have your um, promoting interoperability dashboard. Remember, you have to have a 20, 20, 2015 funct uh, functional letter. I'm sorry, 2015 vendor functional letter, but you have to have 2015 certified software. So you'll pull your dashboard. You should automatically get the proper measures that we mentioned earlier. And you also need to make sure you pull a, a ECQM or a clinical quality measures report to go with your dashboard. And I am going to turn it over at this point so they can explain to you the Health Information Exchange. So Health Information Exchange is another one of our products and also a requirement for providers that are participating in um, the Medicaid promoting interoperability and also the Medicare MIPS um, quality payment program. So it's a requirement for both the Medicaid promoting interoperability, it is objective seven, so it is a requirement. Some of you may be using um, direct messaging. So just kind of to explain this, health information, health information exchange is created to support smaller practices in hospitals. So we are a regional HIE and we are connected to GHIN, which is one of the bigger um, statewide HIEs. So if you connect to us, you will be able to connect to GHIN and get information from some of the bigger hospitals like CHOA, in Grady, in Emory, and some of those places. So we're connected with the government and the jail systems. We're, I know we're connected with Augusta, I think DeKalb. So if you have a patient that's in the jail system, you'll be able to pull information from, the, from our HIE. Um, you'll be able to send and query to get information from our HIE. So the same for the EMS system and some of the other hospitals. So this is a good product to have. It helps the provider to make a great medical decision when you're seeing the patient. And also it helps you to satis satisfy um, some of the objectives and measures in the incentive program. So I'm gonna turn this over to Brianna and she's gonna close this out and kind of give you some of the resources and services we offer to some of our providers. Thanks, Selena. So before we move forward, I would like to um, add in that we do have a few questions in the question and answer chat box. So I'm going to read two questions that we have in there, and I'm just going to go ahead and open it up to anyone that may have a question. Go ahead and just place it in the, in the question box so that we can go ahead and try to answer it. So the qu first question that we have is, are there any suggestions on how to have the patients interact with updates on their portal? Um, we mentioned a few suggestions in the slide before uh, to encourage the patients through either a some type of promotion or or sweepstakes where you say for every time you access your portal you'll be entered to win a fifty dollar gift card mm -hmm. um, and that helps the patients go in and access their portal and look at things. Um, make sure that your patients are aware that they need to have their email notifications on for their portal or they haven't turned them off for, because usually when, as a provider, when you put something on the portal, the patient gets an email notification, sometimes they can turn that off. So they need to make sure that's on so they know to check their portal regularly. Also, I have always found that a nice written script from the doctor works quite well. The doctor writes a written prescription that says, check your portal in two days for your lab results. The patients will usually more likely do that. Um, everybody's e-prescribing now, so it gives you something to use those prescription pads for again, but that helps a lot. Um, also, uh, when you are reminding patients that it's time for their appointment, it is great, especially in these days of COVID, when you don't want your patients in the waiting room filling out their patient history and patient form, set, that, set those items up to go to the portal and encourage them to fill out the forms that way via text or email or log into the portal and fill them out. And once they do that, they have some familiarity with the portal once they come in the office. And if they have some issues with it, 
they're there to ask you specific questions at the time of their appointment instead of after. Thanks, Ryan. Um, we have two more questions. So the next, uh, the, um, next question that we have, um, it says, how do we find out what direct address or what the direct address is for providers? So usually when you signed up for um, direct messaging, you're giving um, a log of all the providers that are on direct messaging. So if you're signed up with it, you should be able to access that from GHEN. They should be able to give you that information of all the providers that are using it. And you only be able to communicate with those providers that are on direct messaging. If they're not using direct messaging, then you cannot communicate and um, transfer data. And a lot of providers are using their own, um, like for example, I know um, eClinical Works has P2P. So some of those providers are connecting, um, communicating through P2P and not through direct messaging. So each provider has to be on direct messaging for them to be able to send um, data by directional. Thanks, Selena. And so, uh, if you, and oh, one more thing, Brianna. Mm -hmm, so, if sure. they're interested, in, if they if, and if you're interested in signing up for direct messaging, and I know I mentioned our HIE, and we have, um, there is, a, and I forgot to mention that. I'm sorry, but we do have funds that will offset some of the costs for the HIE that we provide here at Highbridge. But direct messaging is no cost to your practice. So, if you're interested in that, you can reach out to me, and I can. Um, give you, the, I think the contact person over there is um, Benita with GHEN and I can send you her email and reach out to her and she can get you signed up with that to be able to satisfy that measure as well. Thanks, Selena. We have one more question um, and this could be either to Ryan or Selena. It says, with HIE, how do we shield the info of patients dealing with domestic abuse or sensitive information? Kind of explain that. I guess, I mean, he's talking about, I mean, that information is confidential. So uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly. If I understand, I've dealt with some um, infectious disease specialists and there were some questions about confidentiality mm -hmm. as far as the using the patient portal when they didn't want a partner to know what was going on. However, um, first, you need to make sure you're doing your security risk assessment and that you're following uh, the questions in detail and making sure you have those um, security measures in place and working. But as far as the um, health information exchange goes or direct messaging, any of that, the basis for these things is going to be the security measures that you have on the patient information in the portal, in the patient portal and the EHR. So you should make sure that your logins are only for people working in your facility and that you have a way to disconnect or, or block any logins as people leave the facility. You can even sometimes set time accesses where uh, people can only access either from the office or they can only access during certain business hours because you have, if they're not a physician or in patient care, there's no need for them to access the software 24 hours a day. Um, you wanna make sure that if you're setting up a portal for the patient, that the patient understands that there will be a login for this portal, but they'll also receive no email notifications about activity on the portal. So it's up to that patient really to make sure that Either they have a private email for those, for those notifications to go to, and they set up a password for the portal that is secure to them that no one else could find out. Um, and also, anytime you're, as a physician or a provider, everyone knows that if there's some issues with, to that point with domestic violence, that may be something that needs to be reported. Thanks, Ryan, for that. Um, we have one more question, and I'm going to formulate it a little bit differently um, when I say it, but how can um, a provider or a practice find out if they are already in membership um, with the HIE um, and, and receive more information about direct messaging? Okay, so if you're already um, 
signed up for direct messaging, there's it's, it's um, some settings within your EHR where you can find that information. And um, I know in the past I've had to do it as a practice manager. And I know it's somewhere in your settings, but you can also reach out to GHIN and see if you signed up. Mm -hmm. Or you can also reach out to your EHR vendor because it's somewhere within your settings where you can find um, your actual direct messaging email address. It's within your system. And you're somewhere in your settings. So if you need assistant, assistance with finding that out, just reach out to me and I can reach out to Benita with GN. Or even reach out to your vendor. Assist you with reaching out to your vendor, sorry. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Selena. So some new and exciting news, or not so new, if you haven't heard already, um, Hybrid Solutions has a partnership with Format Approved. Today's featured class from Format Approved is a, is a certificate of HIPAA proficiency for all healthcare staff. The certificate of HIPAA workforce proficiency course provides an annual HIPAA training for all professionals in healthcare who come into contact with protected health information. Its learning objectives include describing HIPAA basics, understanding the HIPAA privacy rules, understanding the HIPAA security rules, explaining regulations for business associates, summarizing HIPAA documentation and training, reviewing applied HIPAA security for healthcare professionals, and also for more information about it, please visit www.formedtrainingcenter.com backslash hybrid solutions and use the coupon hybrid 20 to receive a 20% discount on training for direct access to this training please click, click the link in the chat so I have placed the information in the chat to everyone so if you would like to click over to that and utilize the discount and the training you are more than welcome to thank you guys so much for joining Highbridge hosts an informative webinar every third Tuesday of each month from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Our next webinar will be hosted on Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. So please save the date. Here are a few resources should you need them. So I'm going to let this up for a little while so you guys can just take a look. Here's our contact information right above here and additional links and websites below. If you would like to contact Selena Williams, here is her email above, sewilliams at msm.edu, and her phone number would be 404-752-1193. Once again, thank you so much for joining and have a wonderful day.